So it's Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this session of 49th Comprehensive Course on Echocardiography. Today we have with us none other than Dr. Hansa Gupta, who has been a non nasal cardiologist based nowadays in Paras Hospital in Gurgaon and Apollo Miracle Medical Clinic. Apart from that, she was a consultant at Escort Heart Institute in Oakland, original Escort Heart Institute. And she has been a dynamic general secretary of Indian Academy of Echocardiography, under whose leadership the Academy grew from leaps to bounds. And today we have with us to she's going to uh, talk about cardiopathy in clinical practice. How do we evaluate cardiopathy and how do we look for them non visibly by echocardiography? With these few words, let me hand over my to Dr. Hansa Gupta to start her deliberations. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, for the kind introduction. Good evening, everyone. I hope you all are enjoying the eco training program. So moving ahead with the uh, eco evaluation of cardiomyopathies, we have time crunch and I have to cover a lot of slides. So I'm quickly moving forward. And uh, before uh, taking you to the slides, let us first understand what is a cardiomyopathy. It is a primary disease of the myocardium or myocytes. Okay. And this is a diagnosis which is established by exclusion. What does that mean? That means that once you rule out that this is the, the features you find on ECO are not because of ischemia or chronic valvular diseases or hypertensive heart diseases and pulmonary lung diseases, then only you can label it because doing myopsy, biopsies and all is little difficult. So one has to put everything in context before you start the echo um, examination. You must also look into the history of the patient, the presenting symptoms, the ECG if it is available, so that you can join the dots and reach a diagnosis. All right. So moving forward, WHO has classified uh, cardiomyopathies into the following headings. Um, I'll be first dealing with the, uh, uh, the most important first three, the dilated, hypertrophic, and restrictive. And if the time permits, we'll talk about the other cardiomyopathies in brief as well. So here in this diagram, in this image, this is a normal LV. This is the 3C view, three-chamber view. You can see the LA, LV, and aorta. And this is a normal uh, uh, sized, normal heart. This is the dilated cardiomyopathy. You can very well appreciate that the chamber has dilated. The papillary muscles have spaced each other. There is a dilatation of the left atria and the annular dilatation. So these are few of the features I'll discuss further in details. In this diagram, I'm, I'm just giving you an overview so that while we are dealing with each uh, entity, we will be able to understand the concept. This is the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You can very well appreciate from the normal that the thickness has markedly increased. The LA is increased, size is increased. The cavity is rather small. And this is the restrictive cardiomyopathy. The cavity is almost the normal. The uh, uh, ventricular muscles are more or less the normal or mildly thickened, but the LAs are enlarged. Okay, so moving ahead, I'll be calling this as DCMP. Uh, so first, first entity is dilated cardiomyopathy. The char characteristic features by which you will identify this disease is dilatation of the chamber, the left ventricular chamber, and impaired systolic function of one or both the ventricles. So keep in mind that both these features have to be present before you label the uh, eco finding as the findings suggestive of the, uh, uh, DCMP. Uh, there are several etiologies uh, related to the DCMP. Uh, I'll be just, you know, first talking about the general features, how you see, because in all these non compaction postpartum toxins, or viral myocarditis, which you keep coming across the Taka Subo, which is called as a pical ballooning syndrome. So we'll, let's, let's see how the time permits. Let's go to the basics first. 
So uh, you must understand how the patient can present to you. The patient can present to you with features of low cardiac output, which means fatigue, a lower poor exercise tolerance, or maybe the left-sided or right-sided heart failure. Sorry, I've jumped. Yeah, and uh, the person may present with arrhythmias, history of arrhythmias, sudden cardiac death, or thromboembolic episodes where the LV dysfunction is severe. So, what is the role of echocardiography in uh, DCMP? First is the confirmation of the diagnosis, the assessment of the severity of LV dysfunction, the hemodynamic consequences and guiding the therapy, meaning addition of diuretics, anticoagulants, CRT, chronic resynchronization therapy, or maybe a surgery. So we need to, so ECO has, is a, plays a very, very important role in uh, uh, evaluation of cardiomyopathies. You can see here. Now, first comes the LV systolic dysfunction. So, most commonly, most often, you will find global hypokinesia to be there, but this is not always seen. So what is seen mostly like, you know, uh, many a times, apart from global hypokinesia, you may find that the septum is more involved. Septum is more dysfunctional than the other walls, than the anterior and the lateral walls or the posterior walls. And the severity of the systolic function also varies. It may be 25%, 35%, 40%. So it's not necessary. All depends on the uh, chronicity of the disease, the whether the patient is on any therapy or the volume status. So basically the uh, findings, the features on the echocardiogram keep varying depending on how chronic is the disease, whether the patient is taking therapy, medical therapy for the same, so the findings will keep changing. LV is usually dilated. So for now, you should just remember that the LV is dilated. We'll talk about rest of the uncommon things later on. So this is the video which is showing about a case of dilated cardiomyopathy. You can very well see that the dimensions are markedly increased. All right. And the contraction too is markedly reduced. So here we are getting the two main important features of cardiomyopathy, which are contraction uh, impairment and the dilatation of the chamber. This is the short axis view. Very, very clearly evident that the there is a severe LV systolic dysfunction, right? Again, in the 4C, you can very well appreciate that there is a relative akinesia of the IVS. See her and the apex and the lateral wall. They are clear, clearly moving, okay? While the uh, IVS is more akinetic. So how the um, LB's uh, function is assessed, I'm not going to talk about it because you must be having a separate class. You must have already had a class on this. So we'll, I'll skip on that. This is just a slide showing the Simpsons method for assessing the LB function. The eyeballing is, of course, you know, it all depends on your experience. So now, this is an important index which one must remember while evaluating uh, DCMP, which is a sphericity index. Okay, so you can see here in the 4C, this is the long axis, major axis, and this is the minor axis. So from here till here, you will uh, measure the long axis. And then again, from here to here, this is the minor axis. So normally, the long axis is much, much more than the minor axis. And the ratio, if more than 1.6, it is the normal index. But what happens in the uh, DCMP is that gradually, because of the ventricular remodeling, the uh, LV starts becoming globular or spherical. Okay, Hence, you can see here that both the long axis and the short axis, they are almost equal. All right, so here the ratio is less than 1.5, which is 
abnormal. And this also is a sign of poor, unfavorable outcome in such patients. They are more prone to go into heart failure. So it's important, you know, it will improve your reporting if you know about this index. Now coming to the MOD scan at the mitral valve uh, level, okay? So here we have cut across the anterior mitral leaflet and you can see the waveform here, right? E wave, A wave, this is the septum, this is the posterior wall, and this is the LV cavity. Now what I'm going to show you is, see this. This is an important parameter we are going to discuss here, is the EPSS, all right? EPSS, what is this? This is E point septal separation. See here, this is the distance here. Normally it is less than five to six millimeters. Okay, this, uh, the mitral leaflet is almost near the septum. All right, so this distance if le is less than six millimeter is normal. But what happens in DCMP is, this is increased. Can you see here? And this is suggestive of LB dysfunction. It's 19 millimeter. So there are several factors. The septum is contracting less. The LV has got dilated. The valves are not opening well because of the reduced cardiac output, reduced filling, uh, increased LV diastolic pressure. All right, so all these things have increased the EPSS, E point septal separation. And so this is abnormal. This also, so all the factors together, you must assess do a complete examination to say that yes, the LV dysfunction is severe. See here, another finding here is the B bump. This is the AC shoulder of the mitral leaflet. This is the mitral leaflet waveform. Okay, this is a closure line. This is the AC shoulder. This is a B bump bump here. Okay, this is this also indicates LV dysfunction. Another finding one must evaluate is look forward for, now we have cut the MO through the aortic root and the aortic leaflets. Okay, you can see the aortic root. Okay, there is a box here, the parallelogram kind of thing. These are the, this is the box formed by the aortic leaflets. All right, so now, now uh, see the normal first so that you can understand what is abnormal. See now what has happened in the, severe LV dysfunction. The parallelogram has um, uh, is has disappeared and now the, the uh, uh, valve leaflets are the closing so early. See, because of the poor cardiac output. All right, so all these findings you must uh, elicit because once you know, then only you will elicit. So all of them have to be taken up together to reach a diagnosis. Now I told you the cardiac output is reduced. So uh, just to just to uh, briefly uh, remind you of this, you must have read about it. The cardiac output is calculated with the help of a stroke volume. How is stroke volume calculated? With the help of area into time velocity integral. So how is the area calculated? By measuring the LVOT, all right? So uh, this is the formula. And this is the time velocity integral curve. This is how you keep the PW pulse wave uh, pointer here. And you measure the uh, VTI in the LVOT. And then when you multiply this with the heart rate, you get the cardiac output, which is low in DCMP. So this is just to show you that uh, global longitudinal strain with the help of spectral tracking ECO is one of the latest um, uh, facility that is now available with the ECO machines, many of the ECO machines. So with this, with the help of this, you can assess even the minimal changes in the uh, contraction of the LV and are very helpful in the patients for follow-ups. Now the um, estimation of the reduced LVEF and the um, increased filling pressures. Okay, so how do we estimate the uh, increased LV filling pressures? So we will look at the mitral inflow pattern. 
we'll find that the E wave is much, much more than A wave, generally more than two. The deacceleration slope of E wave is less than 150. The other parameters are E upon E prime ratio. Okay. E prime is obtained by the tissue Doppler assessment of the mitral annulus, the medial or the lateral. And if it is, and if the ratio of the E of the mitral flow and E prime of the tissue Doppler, if, it, if the ratio is more than 15, it is suggestive of raised LV filling pressures. There are other, other parameters too, which you will uh, be you know, taught in the diastolic dysfunction. So I'm skipping that. Okay, coming to this schematic diagram, which is showing the teethering of the mitral leaflets. The MR, mitral regurgitation, is common in DCMP. Why? Now, you know, you understand this so that you can understand that why is it happening and what am I supposed to assess? So there is a ventricular remodeling we all know in this uh, disease. So this light gray color is the original size of the LV. All right, and this is the papillary muscle. but with the ventricular remodeling, the chamber has dilated, the papillary muscle is epically displaced, and hence the cordy are now under tension. These are tethered cordy. So they are again pulling the mitral valve leaflets, the posterior, the anterior, and see what is happening. Okay, so normal, this is this gray one is the normal valve. So how do you see that these are concave and these are convex? I'll show you with a live image. And this, this area under it is called as the, the tenting area. And this is how the uh, valves popped normally. Okay, now normally it is around one centimeter distance. So this is how they popped. But here, what is happening? They're unable to coopt. When they will not coop, what will happen? The blood will flow back into the left atrium. The valves are unable to hold back the blood. So the blood leaks into the left atrium. This is the cause of mitral regurgitation, which is a functional MR. And simultaneously, there is also a annular dilatation. Okay, generally 35 millimeters and above is called as annular dilatation. We measure from end to end. All right. And so these are the things which you will measure while assessing the MR. Once you know the pathophysiology, things become easier to understand and evaluate. See this, you're not able to see the um, uh, uh, cordy, but can you see this convexity which I showed you? All right. And see how they are co-opting. The co-optation distance is less. So they are barely meeting each other. See the MR? At least moderately severe. Okay. See this now. I'll show you one more thing in this image. Wait. See, can you see this? Something uh, swirling inside? This is the spontaneous eco contrast, which is called as uh, reported as SEC. Okay, why is this spontaneous eco contrast coming here? Because the uh, uh, contractility is reduced, the blood is swirling inside, and this is a needus for. Um, clot formation. All right, so be be um, aware about it so that you can look at it. See, it is happening here also. This is the MR, almost going up to the pulmonary vein. Now this is the tenting area. All right, so as I I showed you in that, I'll show you here. This is how you calculate the tenting area, and this is two point six here. So generally, it is less than 2.5 centimeters square. So if the tenting area is less, increased, then also this is abnormal. So let's quickly revise before moving on to the uh, next entity of the cardiomyopathy. What all you find in DCMP. And that's how, like, you know, your report should also, your report should mention all these things, which will show that you are actually aware of these uh, findings and features to how to elicit them and you have actually looked upon for that. So decreased cardiac output, LV contractility, 
and increase LV dimensions in the absence of following. There is LV diastolic dis dysfunction uh, in the subsequent uh, phase of the disease. There's functional MR, which I discussed, LA enlargement, RV dysfunction, LV wall thickness is usually normal, but may be variable. But uh, the LV mass stays the normal. It's uniformly increased because the chamber uh, size is uh, increased. The thickness is generally not altered and the increased E point septal separation. So moving on to another important cardiomyopathy. And, and remember that DCMP and HCM, they're not uncommon. They're genetic diseases, but they're not uncommon. Okay, restrictive is relatively uncommon, but these two one should be having in your mind that you may come across in your labs. Okay, so uh, keep it in mind, it is the incidence is as high as one in 500 general population. This is an inherited disease responsible for sudden cardiac death in young adults. It's autosomally dominant and has been found that at least 11 gene mutations in the sarcomere have been identified and genetic test testing hence is important. I'll tell you how to do a family screening, which you all must know, because you know whenever an HCM is detected, the family members need to be undergoing uh, the eco testing as well as the genetic testing. At what age? I'll, I have made a slide. I'll show you later. So what is the clinical spectrum of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? It may present as heart failure, sudden cardiac death, atrial fibrillation, or may have a longer uh, normal longevity. Now, how do you define? How do you define HCM? It's very, very important because there are cutoffs mentioned. And uh, how would you say that this is HCM and not any other thing? So unexplained LVH. What does that mean? Unexplained LVH, meaning it can be explained with the help of presence of long-standing uncontrolled hypertension. It can be present in uh, severe valvular uh, aortic stenosis and other diseases. Okay, so there it can be explained when no other such uh, disease is present and still you have hypertrophy, then it is called as HCM with non-dilated ventricular chambers in absence of other, I have told you, producing the extent of hypertrophy seen in the patient and uh, rest I'll tell you in the next slide. Again, a schematic diagram for the features of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. See it properly so that once we discuss in the subsequent slides, you will know what all we need to see. This is asymmetric hypertrophy, okay? Asymmetric, this area is more hypertrophic, although the rest is are also, but then this septum is more hypertrophic, all right? That is the systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaflet. So um, you'll be surprised that both AML and PML participate in SAM. There is a stiver uh, diastolic LV dysfunction. There is mid-systolic fluttering of the aortic valves. And as a result of the SAM of AML, there is a mitral regurgitation, functional MR. And can you see? that the arrow is directing posteriorly. So the MR jet is generally posteriorly directed. Okay. So these are the common findings uh, which we look upon uh, while assessing a case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we have talked about asymmetric hypertrophy. What is the cutoff, cutoff of the end diastolic thickness? more than 15 millimeters. So if we find uh, any segment, any segment for that matter, not just septum, any segment to be uh, thicker than 15 millimeters, uh, you must start evaluating and thinking in terms of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. All right, generally the in HCM, the thickness is more. In hypertensive heart disease, it is not all that thick. And also remember, uh, in when when there is uh, presence of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the myocytes are hypertrophic, 
as well as there is a disarray of the myocytes, means they are not properly aligned. And hence, there are a lot of conduction and disturbances and arrhythmias which are noted. So you should have in your mind that arrhythmias are very common because of the myocyte disarray. Okay, now this is the ratio for the ASH, more than 1.3 in normotensives and more than 1.5 in hypertensives. The LVOT is narrow in many of the patients of HCM. You notice SAM of AML, systolic anterior motion of anterior mitral leaflet. I told you that in majority of the patient, both the leaflets, they uh, uh, they are um, they move towards the LVOT. You have LV preserved LV systolic functions. You have diastolic dysfunction, and you will be surprised to know that majority of the symptoms um, of heart failure and the meaning whatever symptoms they are having, they are usually having because of the diastolic dysfunction rather than the LVOT obstruction unless until it is very severe, okay? So next is dynamic LBOT obstruction. So it is dynamic, not fixed. Where do you find fixed? It is found in valvular aortic stenosis, okay? So this is a dynamic LBOT obstruction. So this is also one of the reasons to for the symptoms of the patient. I'll tell you the importance of this LBOT obstruction also because these are few things which you need to mention in your report and need to evaluate to have a, have a complete reporting. Then in many patients, you can have an associated RVH and RVOT obstruction. So need not miss this kind of thing because until you see it, you will not be able to uh, find it. I'll show you a case uh, in my subsequent slides where RVH is there along with the LVH. Now look at this video. This important feature of um, HCM, which differentiates it from the hypertensive heart disease also. Here you can see, this is a plaques view. You can very well see the thickness, thickened uh, anterior septum. Okay, the eco texture is also altered, but the basal posterior is paired. Okay, this is one of the characteristic cardiomyopathy. Whereas in hypertensive heart disease, it is usually symmetric. And this will also be hypertrophied, right? So keep it in mind. Now, what is the uh, pattern which you generally get of the LVH? I've already mentioned it is generalized LVH, but basal posterior is spared. Interventricular septum is usually uh, more hypertrophied than rest of the myocardium, okay? And uh, there may be isolated involvement of the segments of the heart. I'll show you with the help of the um, videos and images. See this? In this, only septum is involved. Okay, rest of the segments are not hypertrophied. It's the inferior wall which is involved. Okay, rest of the segments are normal. So these are isolated variants of HCM. So you should not keep in your mind that all the segments if are not involved. How can I label it as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? It is, these are the variants you may observe. So see the altered texture uh, of the myocardium? It's the anterior wall here. Very, very clearly seen. Okay, I'll skip this slide. Yes, you must uh, um, uh, be careful about like, you know, um, actually differentiating it from some situations which can come across, meaning there is LVH, but there is a posterior, inferior posterior infarct. So the muscles will become thin and you, it will be assumed that probably it is an asymmetric hypertrophy of the uh, septum. Then you may um, uh, uh, measure the anomalous muscle bundles or the trabeculations of RV or the moderator band, one must be careful while uh, measuring the thickness, okay? Then in cardiac amyloidosis, this should be 
differentiated. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the features of this amyloidosis later on. Then you can have sigmoid septum mimicking uh, HCM. Then LVH of elderly. Here the segment, it is called a septal knuckle because of the tortuosity of the aorta. The, there is a septal knuckle in the basal portion, just subaortic. Okay, but that's not considered as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. When the uh, perimembranous VSD spontaneously close, the shape is as if there is a hypertrophy. So I'll show you a few examples. Here, this is the one with the infarct. So can you see the thickness here? This is hypertrophied heart. And this is the infarcted portion. So it's appearing as if this is an asymmetric septal hypertrophy. This is a dilated LA, very well visible. This is a spontaneously closed VSD. So see how this is protruding? So this may mimic as if there is a hypertrophy of the basal segment. Again, now these are the few things which you should, uh, you know, how you should progress um, your evaluation, eco examination in a case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Locate and quantify the hypertrophic segment. As I said, it is not necessary that it will be uh, concentric or symmetrical everywhere. So you even if you see any segment more than 15 millimeters thick, you must locate and quantify. Identify SAM, which is important for the treatment. Okay, and if you're not able to see the SAM, try provoke it. How will you provoke? I'll let you know in the next few slides. Assess the mitral valve apparatus and see the severity of MR. Uh, in HCM, 30 to 50 percent patients have one or other mitral valve uh, deformity. Most commonly, you have elongated mitral leaflets, you have elongated cordy, you have papillary muscle, uh, direct papillary muscle attachment on the anterior mitral leaflet, and so on and so forth. I'll discuss in the few slides, next few slides. Similarly, as we have done for SAM, we will see the gradients because they are very essential at the LVOT level and the mid-cavity level, depending on where the uh, hypertrophy is. So we measure it at rest also and provoke also. Don't leave the patient without uh, subjecting him to provocation because you will not come to know about the hidden uh, gradients, which will help in the uh, symptom elevation of the patient. Yeah. Evaluation of diastolic dysfunction. I told you it is very essential to uh, assess the diastolic dysfunction because the medicines can be given to the patient and uh, the symptoms can be relieved. Evaluation of systolic LV function, which are usually normal. And um, we must un understand that even a mild fall like you know, ejection fraction less than 50% is considered to be a poor prognostic factor in cases of HCM. So one has to be very careful in the evaluation of systolic LV functions, which even uh, reduced by a small amount is detrimental for the patient. The evaluation of the PA pressures, of course, you know, because once the disease progresses, the um, uh, the lungs are overloaded and um, the back pressure goes to the uh, right side. Now, how do you get this systolic anterior motion? Uh, we, uh, most of us, you know, uh, we know that the venturi effect is most important, but no, it is the flow drag, pushing force of the ejection flow which actually falls on the anterior mitral leaflet and pushes it forward from the posterior side. I don't have a schematic diagram of that, but you can find it in the books and you will find that the flow drag is the, uh, see, understand one thing that there is, there are a lot of problems with the anatomy and the geometry of the LV in patients with HCM. All right, so, so the, the papillary muscles, the cordy and everything is not normally placed. So when the ejection flow takes place in systole, 
the uh, flow um, uh, falls on the uh, papillary uh, on the mitral leaflets and drag them forward towards the septum. Septum is anyway elongated, uh, thickened, hypertrophied, and so uh, all this leads to SAM. Right, the uh, the LVOT uh, becomes narrow. The sometimes the elongated body also prolapse in the LVOT, and all these things lead to LV outflow tract obstruction. The, there is also an anterior displacement of the papillary muscle. So I told you that keep it in mind that there is an altered geometry of the LV, and which are all responsible for these developments. There's also a severity grading of SAM. I'll show you the value, um, meaning when the uh, anterior mitral leaflet moves towards septum, we trace it in M mode. And 10 millimeter is the, like, you know, uh, uh, value which has been taken, plus the duration of the systole, less than 40% systole or the holosystolic. I'll just show you. Okay, I have given this slide first. So uh, I think I'll come back to this slide once I tell you about the SAM. Okay, let me just take a sip of water. So here you can see SAM. I'll show you more clearly on this. So this is going towards it, not a very good slide, not a very good image, but let's see here, M mode. Because this is one of the very good ways to detect that. We have cut across the AML, and this is the mitral leaflet uh, waveform. And here is the closing line. See? Okay. And now this is moving towards in the systole. This was the diastole. See here? Now the systole has started. Okay. So this is the interior movement. Now, when you measure this distance as 10 millimeter or 5 millimeter, you can grade the severity. Because severe is the SAM, severe is the LVOT obstruction, and poor is the prognosis. Okay, and uh, the meaning of holosystolic, now you can understand if it is happening, this is not happening, this is happening in the mid systole. All right, see this? So if it is happening throughout the systole, it is great for the most severe one. See here, the SAM is a SAM and hypertrophy. This is producing a turbulence here in the LVOT. Can you see with this mix, red and blue? This generally shows turbulence. There's an MR as well. So now because of the SAM, as I told you earlier, there is a posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. Can you see here? It's not going like this. Okay, it's going posteriorly because the interior mitral leaflet is not... Uh, in apposition with PML properly. See the turbulence? So there's an LVOT obstruction. Let me go back and let me talk a uh, bit about the LV outflow tract obstruction, which is very, very important. So understand it is a dynamic obstruction, not fixed. It occurs mainly in mid and late systole. SAM and mitral septal contact is the uh, uh, is the main cause. There is a narrow LVOT as well. There can be a caudal apparatus prolapse leading to it. There's an abnormal papillary muscle insertion on a AML, which makes the LVOT narrow. Now, what is more important to identify is how is the velocity waveform when there is an obstruction. This is a very, very categorical and typical um, uh, uh, picture which you get and you can never forget, okay? This is a Turkish dagger shape. I'll show you. Uh, this is usually the onset of this waveform is soon after the QRS. Why is it important to understand is because we need to differentiate it with the MR, which all lie along the same uh, beam, actually. When you are interrogating these with the Doppler, the MR may also fall in the same uh, area, same um, uh, uh, beam. Okay, so you may confuse. So MR generally uh, starts within the QRS. I will show you that also. So remember, this is the onset is after the QRS. The jet is narrower. 
now we, how are we, what are we comparing it with? You may get a AS, you may get a MR. So you need to differentiate. Is it the LVOT obstruction you are dealing with or an AS or an MR? Okay, so the jet is narrower, finishes early. Obstruction is maximum in late systole and hence you get a late peaking curve. I'll show you. The contour is concave to the left. These are again to differentiate with the uh, waveforms of the AS, aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation. Larger and longer is the SAM. Significant is the obstruction I told you earlier. An apical 3C view is the best view. Why? Because the Doppler beam is parallel. You are able to uh, not mix it with the other flows. All right. So you will always search for a view wherein your beam is not interrogating any other flow. So I was discussing that you should differentially diagnose the LVOT jet with the MR jet to avoid overestimation. Usually the MR jet is having high is uh, has high gradients so you you may tend to overestimate so i'll show you the figures and you will never forget that this is not a uh, mr this is not a lvot jet this is an mr jet and vice versa see so this is a typical dagger shape late peaking gradient. Now, can you see this QRS complex? So this starts soon after that. And can you see this concavity? Concavity, because MR generally goes like this. If I have an image, I'll show you. It will go like this, early systolic, okay? It will be rounded. But here, can you see this is the concave pattern? You should never forget this image. Okay, because you may get it in other cases also, I'll tell you. And here is the gradient of 41, all right, in the LVOT. See this? This is a dynamic obstruction. This is valvular aortic stenosis. This also starts after QRS, but the early systolic, this thing, and there is a rounded, and it is kind of longer flow, okay? So now, how will you assess the LVOT gradient? Let me see. Uh, okay, so for this, you know, you should do a stepwise approach. First, put the uh, continuous wave Doppler across the LV to find the maximum gradient. Okay, once you locate the maximum, uh, identify the maximum gradient, now you need to know that where is this gradient coming from? Is it from the LV outflow tract? or from the mid cavity, which is also possible in the mid um, uh, cavitary obstruction. So then you will go step by step. From the apex, you will put a pulse wave and you will keep coming down towards the LVOT. And wherever you find the maximum, you will assess that and locate that where is the maximum obstruction, because that is also very essential for the treatment of like myomectomy or the septal uh, ablation. Okay, so you you assess the gradient at rest also and with provocation. So what are the provocation most, most commonly used are? Valsalva. Uh, you know, it is a little difficult to perform a Valsalva and simultaneously keep measuring it, keep measuring your uh, uh, gradients because there is a movement and the probe may move. So little difficult. Standing, it has been found that um, you make the person stand and do some exercises and the gradients are very well provoked. You make the person lie down and you'll see that the gradients are provoked. You may ask, uh, it is also said that uh, cycle, uh, bicycle stress test, meaning you, you're lying down on the bed, either there is a, a cycle there or you may just uh, ask the person to do a cycling um, on the bed itself. And then post that, you can see the gradients. So this is called as provocation. And uh, sublingual nitrate and all these are not very um, like acceptable. These are not routinely used. Most of us, we are using the exercises or the valsalva maneuver. 
okay now next in next slide i'll tell you how these gradients are provoked with the uh, these maneuvers standing or exercise see valsalva and all these maneuvers they decrease the preload or the venous return and hence they decrease the lb volume so anything that reduces the preload the afterload the lv volume or the lv contractility is increased the gradient increase because the size of the cavity reduces it is already obstructed and it is further increasing the obstruction so all these maneuvers so if you also remember that if you give drugs like calcium channel blockers or the ace inhibitors which are prohibited in this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy why they are prohibited because they are like you know they will reduce the afterload and they will provoke the gradient and the patient will become symptomatic so that's why these drugs are contraindicated in hcm so this is how and and you know if you get hypovolemia the volume is uh, decreased again so the low so low, cab low, cab low contractility uh, is there not the low contractility the volume is reduced and hence the gradients are again provoked so dehydration is a problem in such patients all right so this is the concept behind the provocation see this so this is a pulse wave doppler a pulse wave has been placed here and so that is why you are seeing the aliasing also okay because the gradients are more see the dagger again you have a gradient of 41 and i think they'll show you the provocation see the provocation the gradients are 82 now after the provocation it is very very essential that you provoke the patient so as to understand if there is a gradient why because there is no treatment apart from uh, reducing the gradient so at least you know give a sincere attempt to uh, provoke the gradients if at all they are there now see this is the most important slide see it properly the lvot gradient at rest on provocation and how is it labeled so hcm now turns as hocm hocum okay because at rest and on provocation the gradient goes more than 30 what is latent the one which is uh, the was not having gradient but on provocation the gradient goes more than 30 what is non obstructive hocum uh, hcm it is both at rest and provocation we did not get any gradient any gradient no meaning less than 30 so 30 is the cut off just keep it in your mind see this very 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 clearly seen that there is no obstruction here okay the flow is lvot is clear okay see no turbulence the blood is flowing freely despite of the fact that there is hypertrophy now the most common confusion comes with the hypertensive heart disease mm -hmm. i'll quickly tell you that how can you differentiate in hypertensive heart disease the 12 lead ecg is like you know isolated increased voltage is there but no repolarization abnormalities which are found in hcm the hypertrophy is usually symmetric and involves basal posterior also which is not found in this the basal posterior is spared diastolic dysfunction sets in early sets in late but is severe regression of lvh over 6 to 12 months with tight systolic blood pressure control of less than 130 so you start having regression but not here in these cases and then mri and many other uh, modalities are there which can you know establish the diagnosis there's another entity called as athlete's heart you all must be knowing so here also one controversy comes but in athlete's heart the hypertrophy is symmetric and not very um, uh, the hypertrophy is, uh, the muscle thickness is not extreme this is a mild hypertrophy and the important thing is just a minute ha huh. the important thing is that the lb is mildly dilated meaning the diastolic volumes are increased whereas in uh, uh, hcm it is decreased the volumes are low there is no diastolic dysfunction whatsoever uh, despite of thickness and dilated lv 
and uh, the hypertrophy regresses after stopping exercises for a few weeks. And we also can get the history of strenuous exercises. So these are common things like, you know, you can do with the help of history, keeping in mind the uh, differential diagnosis. Because again, as I said, that if you don't have an MRI, if you don't have any other uh, thing to establish the diagnosis, at least we can work out on this, on these um, findings. Okay, I told you about the aortic valve abnormalities. Okay, so there is a fluttering. There's a mid-systolic closure. There's a mid-systolic closure here in the aortic valve. Can you see this? Followed by a fluttering of the valve. So this is again due to the LVOT gradients occurring, increasing during the mid-systole and then increasing to peaking towards the late systole. Um, let's leave this because of the time crunch. MR, this also I have said. And always remember that there is a mitral valve apparatus anomaly in 30 to 50 percent of the patients so this is the mr i have shown you yes this is important okay this is what i was trying to tell you this is the can you see two jets within one uh, uh, image this this jet the one which is curved is the uh, lvot jet and this is the mr jet the arrows are showing the border of the mr jet this is starting right within the QRS, at the onset of the QRS. And this starts a little later. It is concave. And so this is how very high gradients of uh, might, uh, MR, early systolic boundary. Okay, so this is how you should keep in mind that um, how to differentiate with MR and not to uh, overestimate. Okay, so coming to the other variants is the apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Why is it important and I have mentioned about it is that it is often missed if not properly looked for. I'll show you a case because, you know, uh, he just underwent a uh, ECG for the routine examination in the office and deep T-wave inversions were found in the precordial leads and is called as Yamaguchi syndrome. And LVH may be very difficult to pick unless we are careful about it. Okay, there is no LVOT obstruction though. And if it is not very clearly visible, either we will do a contrast eco study or we'll go for an MRI. So this is the apical cardiomyopathy. Okay, we need to differentiate it from the uh, endomyocardial fibrosis also in the restrictive cardiomyopathy or the left Loeffler's endocarditis. Here you will see the ventricular cavity despite of the uh, thickening. Okay, the apex is not obliterated. When I'll show you the images, you will understand what is the obliteration of the LV apex. Here, the apex is visible. You can also put the color Doppler to identify that. See this? The apex is thickened. You can see the cavity. It's a typical spade-shaped ca cavity. It is called as a spade-shaped cavity. All right? Like this. So mid-ventricular hypertrophy, another important uh, uh, variant which is commonly noted, there's a disproportionate hypertrophy at the mid-LV level. There are two, three things which are important in, uh, in this variant. You may, be, you may find an apical LV aneurysm with this, uh, this. So be watchful. There is no gradient in LVOT, but you may come across a gradient at mid-LV cavity level. And there may also be some dysfunctional apex along with this. See this very clearly visible. See this dysfunctional apex. This is a hypertrophy at the mid-level. The LVOT is very clear. There's no thickening here. The septum is less, but then this area lateral wall is more thickened. Very clear, mid-level, mid-LV hypertrophy. See? Be careful about this because this is a nidus for the thrombus. See this? Now you can see the obstruction coming here at the mid-level rather than at the LVOT level. See again the dagger. Dagger will be, it's not a uh, like, you know, complete dagger, but yes, it's almost like that. Okay. Now I'll show you a few images that images are not very good, but I just wanted you to have a feel of that. Wait. 
So this is a kind of, you know, um, severe concentric LVH. Here the RV is also involved. See this? RV is also involved. The papillary muscles are also involved. See this? Severely hypertrophied. Now see this. The, there is also some foreshortening here, but uh, we can very well appreciate. Okay? See this? The papillary muscles also. Everything is so badly thickened. But there is no SAM here. See this? The strain imaging, the global longitudinal strain is around minus 16, which is mildly low. So the patient needs to be followed because, you know, uh, once it is low, uh, the uh, importance of AICD comes into picture. So the, the patient needs to be followed in this case. This was the presented the, the ECG which he presented with. See all non-specific T wave inversion, repolarization abnormalities. This is the apical cardiomyopathy case which I got. Can you see here? You know, it's an aneurysm kind of thing. You know, which I uh, observed, right? And I have sent the patient to uh, for cardiac MRI, which did not show any aneurysm. See here, the deep symmetrical T waves, a very typical picture of Yamaguchi syndrome. Very, very typical ECG. So he, he was from the office. He just went for a routine ECG. It was discovered. He was ordered an uh, ECO. He came to me and then we discovered this. Got an MRI done. The apical aneurysm means ICD. So it was very important for us to get the cardiac MRI done. And uh, there was no aneurysm in, there, in that, although the hypertrophy was there with a patchy uh, LGE. We'll tell you about this later on. So the patient was saved of ICD. So just remember these kind of pictures. You know, if the ECG is available, you have to look for um, uh, hypertrophy in the apex very, very carefully. Don't miss it. See the ECG and think that, you know, no, there is some hypertrophy somewhere. Okay. So screening, uh, I can't uh, skip this slide because screening of first degree relatives is very, very important and has to be done at least once. Now, what is recommended in children between 12 to 18 years of age, every year it should be done because till 18 years of age, it may develop at any point of time. After 18 years of age, once every five years will be okay because uh, it may not necessarily be present at birth. At some time of uh, uh, growth uh, of the child, uh, it may develop. So it is very necessary that the screening is to be done and you must know that how often you order the screening of uh, first degree uh, relatives. So what are the unfavorable outcomes? This is very, very important. You must know about it. The maximum wall thickness of more than 30 millimeters, the incidence of sudden cardiac death is very high, 1% to 2% every year. And uh, it is a clear indication for ICD implantation. And hence, your report should not miss. When you are reporting a HCM case, you should always mention about the maximum wall thickness, whatever it is. This will show that, yes, you are aware about uh, this cutoff of 30. You should clearly mention it is less than 30 or whatever, like, you know, it is 18, 19, whatever. But your report should not miss the maximum wall thickness. Anywhere it is, like, you know, in the septum, in the inferior, in the posterior. Whatever is the maximum, it needs to be reported. LVOT gradient of more than 30 is unfavorable. EF less than 50 is unfavorable. So these are the parameters, you know, which which uh, tell us that, you know, the patient is at high risk. So eco-reporting should not miss. This is very important, maximum wall thickness. SAM is present or not. Okay, you need to mention. Even though if it is not present, you should uh, mention it so that the person, the clinician, the uh, cardiologist knows that you have the, uh, the SAM in your mind. Then LVOT gradient at rest and provocation both. Even if it is like, you know, 27 and 27, you write at rest and provocation both, 27 mmHg. 
and report the MRCVRT. This is how your report will uh, show that you are a very good echocardiographer and trained by JROP, right? Okay, coming to the last entity, restricted cardiomyopathy. I'm again going to have a sip of water, just a second. Okay, now this restrictive cardiomyopathy, RCM, is something like, you know, the patient is presenting to you with a heart failure with preserved heart functions, all right? So it is an idiopathic or systemic myocardial disease characterized by restrictive ventricular physiology in the presence of normal or decreased diastolic volumes, normal systolic function, normal or mildly increased ventricular wall thickness. I'll show you, I'll show you more features, okay? So remember, you are getting a restrictive ventricular physiology in the presence of normal systolic functions. So I'll tell you, you know, how we learned over, we came across such cases. So if you come across mitral inflow pattern showing restrictive pattern, Systolic functions are normal, chamber dimensions are normal, your atria is enlarged. Immediately start thinking of restrictive physiology. So maybe restrictive physiology due to uh, cardiomyopathy, cardiomyopathy or maybe due to other restrictive heart diseases. So remember three things, restrictive ventricular physiology, normal systolic functions, Dilated biatrial, biatrial dilatation is usually there. So this is showing that, you know, it is a severe grade three. I told you E is much, much more than A. And here E prime, A prime velocities, both are reduced. And E prime is less than A prime on tissue Doppler. What is the pathophysiology? It is basically the small, thick-walled, rigid ventricles. Okay, the rigid ventricles, they are producing a severe diastolic dysfunction leading to enlargement of the left atria, leading to back pressure, producing the right ventricular um, uh, pressure overload and, uh, and dilated RA. Okay, leading to all these symptoms of dyspnea. Okay, so as I told you, patient will present with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So restrictive physiology should come into your mind quickly. So, as I said, it is one of the many restrictive heart diseases. You may, with the hypertension, you may get it. With HCM, you may get it. With restrictive heart disease of the elderly, because all, all at all these places, the myocardium starts becoming rigid. And then, you know, chronic constrictive pericarditis, another uh, big thing which mimics RCM. So, all these things should be in your mind, and one by one, you can rule it out. So the causes, they, they can be myocardial causes, they can be endomyocardial causes, non-infiltrative, infiltrative storage disorders, okay, in which idiopathic is important, amyloidosis is important, then the storage disorders, sarcoidosis, gaucher, hemochromatosis, time does not permit to discuss all this, but you must understand the basic physiology of RCM, which may be because of all these things, and now with the availability of MRI and um, with the blood test and maybe some biopsies. See, endomyocardial biopsy is not very easy. So it is it is a little difficult. And, and again, uh, a, a diagnosis, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. The endomyocardial uh, causes include the endocardio, uh, endocardial my, endomyocardial fibrosis, hyperisnophilic syndrome, carcinoid, Radiation, toxicity, and anthracycline toxicity. So what is the... Kindly mute yourself. Okay. When do you suspect RCMP? I have already told you restrictive physiology with normal systolic functions. What are the other steps? So with the help of ECO, where are we reaching? We are reaching with the functional diagnosis. And the etiological diagnosis can only be established with the help of myocardial biopsy. So, normal size ventricles with normal EF, 
LVH and RVH may or may not be present. There's a significant diastolic dysfunction of both LV and RV, biatrial enlargement, mild MR and TR, increased PA pressures. And there are in such, a, such certain situations like EMF and all, that you can find clots in the appendages and dilated IVC. So again, these are grades you must uh, be taught in different class related to diastolic dysfunction, E more more than A, this is a pulmonary vein flow. In the grade, severe grades, you will find that the diastolic flows are much more than systolic. In normal systolic, this is how the waveforms are. The atrial reversal is increased. It is around 35 in a severe grade. Then on the tissue Doppler imaging, this is how you get the E prime and the A prime. See how they are reduced here. E is much reduced than A. Although, but the overall uh, uh, the overall velocities are also increased or uh, decreased as compared to the normal. So this is how you can all assess with the help of the mitral inflow pattern, with the TDI of the mitral annulus, with the pulmonary vein flow interrogation. Then IVC is dilated and non-collapsing. Okay, again because of the back pressure, right? So this range again you all know to estimate the PA pressures. Just understand that the IVC is dilated and non-collapsing. Non-collapsing means it's collapsing less than 50% on a sniff test or deep inspiration. Sniff test is better. Now, let's talk a little bit about the hepatic vein Doppler without going into the details because this is important in the restriction physiology. This is a normal and this is a restriction physiology. This is the respirometer, which is which tells you because it helps to identify the inspiration and the expiration. See this, this is the normal, normal, and this is a systolic. So generally a hepatic vein, which is vertically draining into the IVC. The first hepatic vein is usually identified and interrogated. And um, see here, systolic waveform, systolic reversal, diastolic waveform, diastolic reversal. Now, what happens in restriction? They're all increased. The diastolic forward flow is also increased. And in inspiration, both the things are in, uh, increased. Okay. While in CCP, the chronic constrictive pericarditis, see now during expiration, they have come down. But in CCP, they will increase during the expiration. So this is how if you interrogate the hepatic vein, um, uh, uh, with a Doppler, you may find systolic and diastolic flow reversals to be increased in inspiration, which mark towards the restrictive physiology. See here? This is what is mentioned here. During expiration, CCP flow reversals are increased during expiration. Uh, let's skip this. Coming to the amyloid heart disease, it is very important to remember and understand this briefly because, you know, uh, it's now uh, a, a, a much talked about uh, disease entity because now a treatment is available. Earlier, the treatment was not available. The diagnostic methods were not available. Hence, this disease was ignored. So this in this disease, the light chains get uh, mutated and they are precipitated in different organs like heart, kidney and bones. So most commonly seen and which can be treated are primary amyloidosis or the AL type of protein and the familial cardiac amyloidosis transthyretin 1. All right, they involve the heart. See this? So what is the difference here with the hypertrophy? In the hypertrophy, these are the myocytes, they are hypertrophied. While in this, there is no hypertrophy of the myocytes, rather the amyloid chains get deposited in sheets in the interstitium leading to the thickness of the, myo the myocardium. All right. So it is not the myocyte hypertrophy as in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It is basically deposition in the interstitium. The clinical presentation is... The commonest is restrictive, it presents as a restrictive cardiomyopathy. Maybe later on there is a mixed picture. 
there may be a uh, congestive heart failure, systolic dysfunction, postural hypertension, or arrhythmias. Now, these are important. Just remember this. Increased LV wall thickness, RV wall thickness. You may also see that speckled appearance, which is talked about, but it is not diagnostic and is not specific of amyloid, hence don't get confused. Small, well, or poorly contracting LV. The enlarged LA, again, due to systolic, uh, diastolic dysfunction. There are valve thickenings, which is important. There can be mitral regurgitation, but mild. There's a th thickened interatrial septum. So when it is more than two millimeter, generally the interatrial septum is called as thickened. There can be diastolic dysfunction I mentioned, atrial arrest. Uh, the, we'll discuss it later. The A waves are not seen despite of uh, the normal ECG. The pericardial effusion is noted in the advanced disease. Okay, in, uh, the, uh, in HCM, the pericardial effusion is not common. So since this, is, this also presents as thickening of the myocardium, so we need to understand that how will you differentiate it with the hypertensive uh, cardiomyopathy. See this now. Okay, so there is a symmetric thickening. This is not hypertrophy, this is thickening, and this is the speckled appearance. Okay, you should have in your mind that probably this is amyloid. See this? The sept interatrial septum is also thickened. The valves are thickened. This, not these, but uh, somewhat here. The RV is also thickened. LV function looks normal. In uh, amyloidosis, all the uh, E prime, S prime, A prime, all the TDI velocities they are reduced is very pathognomic, uh, meaning it is called as five sign, five dash sign. All all are reduced less than five. Okay, so uh, five, five, five. All everything is less than five. See here, the systolic velocities are also less than five. So this is called as triple five sign of amyloidosis. But definite diagnosis is biopsy. Um, can't finish RCM before we talk about a little about the endomyocardial disease, wherein you find obliteration of the ventricular epicysis and subvalvular region. The PML, the posterior mitral leaflet, is generally affected. And uh, uh, there are two types. The they, they have the similar phenotypes, but then... The reasons are different. The Loeffler's endocarditis due to hyperesnophilia and the EMF or Davies disease. The etiology is not known. You, in this, you just understand that there is a degranulation of eosinophils, toxins are produced, leading to necrosis of the endomyocardium, leading to thrombus formation. So there are a lot of thrombi in this, in this kind of disease which get layered and lead to thickening and obliteration of the epices and the uh, endocardium okay it gives a so final stages of healing which is fibrosis the hyper eosinophilic syndrome tends to involve the uh, left ventricular posterior wall the papillary muscles the posterior mitral valve leaflet leading to mitral regurgitation i'll show you the images which will help you in keeping this in mind see this rv side this pink color and this pink color. All right. So there is a thickening, almost obliteration of the epices, the dilatation of the atria, okay, by atrial enlargement. See this? The LV function is normal. Both the atria are dilated. The RV apex obliterated. The LV apex is obliterated. And in such cases, the thrombus is also to be uh, detected at the apex. So both the RV and LV inflow and the valves can be involved. R LV uh, is involved in 40% and RV in 10%. There's again, see this diagram. Without going into the much of the details, see this diagram, which will bring into your mind. See this? Both the apex are obliterated. See this schematic diagram.
see this in the fourth chamber, the RV. RV is like almost so narrow, small. So obviously you will have a congestive heart failure. See this? So you will have to dif differentiate this with the apical hypertrophic cardi cardiomyopathy, wherein the apex is not completely obliterated. You will have a cavity in between like a spade. You can put a color doppler and see it, or if not able to see, you can use contrast. Here, the apex is completely obliterated with the fire recurrent scarring, thrombus, and fibrosis. So these are found in uh, tropical regions and temperate regions. So one must have this in mind. See the RV? Entirely blocked apex. So this is called as box and glove sign. This is the uh, LV ventricular uh, uh, angiogram. You are seeing the hand here, like the, you know, the uh, die is here. This is the obliterated uh, apex, which is appearing like a glove. See this? all obliterated. So cardiac MRI comes to the rescue in distinguishing the various type of cardiomyopathies and uh, differentiating RCM with the CCA, CCP and also in cases of the storage disorders uh, in differentiating amyloidosis. We'll take this um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, cardiac MR findings in the advanced course. This is beyond uh, this uh, this time to you know discuss about the cardiac MR finding. However, wherever uh, we find uh, that the uh, uh, that there is a suspicion of cardiomyopathy and we are not able to reach the diagnosis properly and which will hamper the treatment, you must order a cardiac MRI CMR so as to differentiate the etiology and establish the diagnosis. So restriction versus constriction. This is the last thing. Muscle disease, pericardial disease, both result in restrictive physiology, but there are differences. Here the uh, LV is compliant, non-compliant and stiff. It is reverse. No significant ventricular interdependence. There is a dependence. There is a respiratory variation in the mitral valve and tricuspid valve. Inflow velocities. Then septal bounds, you will keep hearing about this. Septal bounds found in CCP. See this on the M mode, cut across. This is showing the systolic and diastolic dual component due to the RV and LV change in pressures. So ventricular filling is restricted throughout the diastole. The dysfunction is severe. Dysfunction is not that severe. Happens only during the late diastole. So these are some of the differentiating features which when you will read about the uh, pericard uh, pericarditis, yeah. We will uh, discuss all this in that. Okay. Okay. So just to quickly revise Achha. LV diastolic dysfunction, please mute yourself. Achha, minute, minute, minute. LV diastolic dysfunction in absence of pericardial disease, aortic stenosis, hypertension, you'll find restrictive filling pattern, non-dilated ventricles, the volumes are less, mildly increased LV wall thickness depending on the etiology, hepatic vein flow reversals, biatrial enlargement, moderately increased pulmonary artery systolic pressure, dilated IVC, normal systolic function in majority, and a normal pericardium. Thank you so much. Over to Dr. Akish Gupta. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ansa, for uh, taking this. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Janvi will take care of the thank you word. Uh, just leave it for some time. Uh, let's take up a question answer session if you have any. Uh, this is for cardiomyopathy. Uh, you can raise your hand and I'll take up those question answers one by one. Sachi, go ahead. Ask the first question. Sir, Rakesh, sir, uh, your voice is very low, sir. I think you can ask the first question. Dr. Sachi, please go ahead and ask the first question.
डॉक्टर तन्मय रॉय अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ बटन ऑफ द्रेस ऑन दशीन इट विल ट्रेस देंटिंग एरिया यू विल हैव टू डू इट फ्रॉम द बेस टू बेस लेट मी सी इफ आई एम एबल टू yeah it's coming yeah so see here it has been just traced from here to here base of the uh, valve leaflets and till their coaptation point see this can you see yes ma'am yes. so i told you this valve area of uh, this tenting area of 2.5 cm square if it is less than that it is okay but then if the tenting area is increased of course you will have to you will get more uh, regurgitation All right, so this is just done with the help of a trace. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sachi Surendran. Unmute yourself. Uh, good evening, oh, madam. Good evening, uh, madam. Uh, how to measure the apical HCM? How, how to, to measure the apical HCM? Hypertrophy. Okay. okay so first see apical hypertrophy you have to understand that more than the measurement see measurement everywhere it is the same it has to be more than the normal like you know if you say 13 mm is normal so anything more than that as you measure, measure at other places similarly you will measure in the apex i told you any segment may be thickened and you will measure the similar way as you measure the septum or the posterior wall right so you have to see you know there are color maps on your on your machine when you will put on the color maps the myocardium is very well delineated and you will be able to see the um uh, cavity also lv cavity and also do one more thing that you go towards the uh, go in the short axis and go start going towards the apex you will suddenly see that the apex uh, the lv cavity is getting narrower and obliterated okay and that is also okay. where you can uh, measure the uh, lv hyper apical hypertrophy this is the most difficult to measure okay but this is how you can keep in your mind that possibly this is apical and of course you need to correlate with your ecg and other findings and if you have any doubts apical cardiomyopathy is one of the variants wherein cardiac mri is the most helpful okay am i clear yes ma'am how to do yeah. how to differentiate apical hcm with uh, takatsubu syndrome ma'am aha uh aha -huh, uh -huh. so apical doesn't mean uh, it in takatsubu you have akinesia okay okay in apical it is there is no akinesia it is just the thickening okay. and also you need to understand the background of takasubo it is generally a stress induced you are, the patient is in icu sick stressed under some kind of you know bad emotional stress mostly post menopausal women are there okay uh, those those who suffer from this here the mid and the basal segments are hyperkinetic the apex is high, um, akinetic and ballooning right whereas in apical you will not find rest of the uh, things history you can take uh, the thickening is there but not the dysfunction okay all right okay hmm. so there is a very simple way is you focus or you zoom on a apical segment once you focus or zoom on a apical segment is then you go in diastole and measure the thickness of the apical segments anything more than 13 mm some people says 15 mm if it's more than 15 mm obviously is a characteristic for apical hypertrophy 
important very thing. right ha you can important zoom it yes zoom it second thing is you can go to the now go to the normal picture go and measure the bases of that ap apical four chamber view the bases should be normal and the apex should be hypertrophic and then yeah. call them apical hypertrophic apart Correct. from going for cardiac mri we do a myocardial contrast echo also this myocardial contrast echo typically gives you a picture of people leaf a uh, people's tree leaf aapne kabhi ek people ka ped dekha hai any time you have seen people tree the leaf of that people tree is classical of apical hypertrophy so you'll find the same kind of a pattern yeah. in apical hypertrophy correct okay. so let's move on to the next person uh, i'm not able to identify who is on ipad so let me move on to dr navin navin go ahead and ask your question Naveen, go ahead. I think we can take another question by the time. Dr. Muhammad Ali Qasim, unmute yourself and go ahead, Dr. Muhammad Ali Qasim. Thank you, Madam, for a brilliant lecture. Madam, in case of mid cavity obstruction, the apex is look like aneurysm, and sometimes it is aganitic. Yeah. I'll how would you differentiate from it is a true aneurysm and or or either mid cavity obstruction uh, due to uh, an apical variety due to apex changes in mid cavity obstruction? So, uh, Dr. Kasim, uh, with the mid ventricular obstruction, the obstruction is very clear. I have shown you the yes, uh, yes. video also. The uh, mid uh, level obstruction is very clear. All right. And as we evaluate the other um, uh, segments for the LV systolic function, similarly, we will estimate the apex also. Again, as it is said that, you know, because there may be an aneurysm, there may be a simply a dysfunction. Okay. So as you estimate the uh, systolic uh, thickening, so as, again, as Dr. Rakesh has said, you can zoom and see that area. Okay, and lastly, then, you know, the contrast is another thing which will tell you about the thickening. So, the aneurysm and the apex, these are the most difficult areas to be evaluated. They are the gray zones. Need to be really careful. So, three steps are there. You zoom it, see it properly, because if there is an aneurysm, it will be seen. Unless and the, until the patient is very obese, very thick, you're not getting a good window. But we are able to see the apex properly and you can see whether it is like akinetic, normal or aneurysmal. The next step is contrast. Next step is cardiac MRI. Okay. Uh, what's your exact question is? Your exact question is apical aneurysm versus uh, mid-cavity gradient aneurysm. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. Apical changes in mid-cavity obstructions. Correct. So, what you need to say is, you want to say how do we differentiate between apical uh, aneurysm versus mid-cavity apical aneurysm. Yes, sir. Right. If there's an apical aneurysm, would there be any gradient at the mid-cavity? No. Huh? With apical aneurysm, will there be any gradient in the mid-cavity? No, sir. You got the answer. Why this apical aneurysm forms because of mid cavity? Because a lot of pressure leads to ballooning of the apex. And that apex has got a preserved endocardium. In apical aneurysm, apical aneurysm is formed because of a coronary artery disease. Is that clear? One will have a gradient, other will not have a gradient. Apical aneurysm because of coronary artery disease will not have a gradient, and a mid cavity obstruction leading to apical aneurysm will have a gradient. Very simple way of looking at it. Is that clear, or still we need to explain you more? Oh, no, sir, it's clear, sir. Okay, let's move on to the next person, Dr. Sir, Manik. I have Chandra. a question, I'm not able to show the hand, but I have a question, Mahananda. Go ahead, Mahananda, sir. Uh... What is the VSIL wall ratio that I could not, uh, what is the full form VSIL? In okay. 
Okay, that's the interventricular septum, ventricular septum. And when you are, an aisle is the inferior lateral wall. This is a new terminology for the posterior wall. Okay. So you must be reading uh, all this time the uh, anterior septum upon the posterior wall ratio for uh, detecting asymmetrical septal hypertrophy. Okay. Right. So that is uh, usually uh, more than 1.3 is labeled as ASH, asymmetric septal hypertrophy. So this is ventricular septum or the anterior septum, which is seen on plaques uh, upon the inferior lateral wall thickness. Okay. And another is, madam, uh, how you will differentiate restrictive versus constrictive on the uh, mitral annulus velocity basis. Explain again, like E by E prime and all this thing. Okay, let me show you this. See, this yes. Yeah, so this, this thing will be covered, I think, Dr. Akesh, in their uh, pericardial diseases. It is getting covered. Yeah, so that will be clear because I just wanted to tell you that, you know, you need to keep in your mind about, and I quickly, hurriedly actually rushed through this. It's given actually in the slide, didn't want to cover this. Yes. See here. Okay. E prime is almost invariably less than 8. It's almost invariably more than 8. This is the TDI you are talking about, the mitral annulus. Yes, yes. Madam. Right? Yes. Ah. E upon E prime is abnormal more than 15. E upon E prime is normal here, less than 8. Okay. Did this answer your question? Yes, yes, madam. Yes. All right. This only I wanted. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you, madam. Yeah. Dr. Mani Chandra Sinam. Dr. Manichandra, go ahead. Yes, sir. Actually, madam, you talk about the hepatic band Doppler where you told something like uh, a systolic reversal and diastolic reversal. Can you discuss in detail about that part? Yeah, so that will again be handled, you know, separately when the hepatic vein interrogation will be done. Okay, but these reversals are related to inspiration and expiration. And it is useful in the uh, differentiation of the constrictive versus restrictive physiology. Okay, they will again be handled separately. So that's why I didn't, um, so there's so much in this, you know. So that's why it is said that, you know, when you learn the basics, you put them all together while um, establishing a disease. Okay. So, Madam, what actually means that systolic reversal is? So these are all uh, dependent on the flow patterns of the uh, flow from hepatic vein to the IBC and to the RA. So this is telling you about the right-sided physiology. Okay, hepatic vein, uh, where does it drain? It drains into the IBC. IBC. IBC drains into the RA. Right? Yes, ma'am. I'll show them a slide. Just uh, huh, Because I think a slide will be better to... Uh, Show the phenomena. May I request it was discussed talk? by Sir Nain MR. Hmm. Janni, give me a give me us two minutes time. Janni, please give us two minutes time. Uh, can you may I request you to unshare your slides? Stop sharing. Yeah, slides? yeah. It will take me one minute to get to that level. Yeah. It's a very interesting phenomena which Dr. Hansa was trying to explain. Uh, let me show you in a very tactical slide format and that'll be good for you.
give me a second because I'm just trying to look for the yeah. presentation because uh, so many slides and everything. Okay, all right. Slide 93. This is actually a topic in itself. Yeah, it's a full topic in itself. Yeah. Uh, look at this pattern of this slide is, this is all beginning of a QRS complex to another beat. I'll not take because this is a bigemony which is going on. Hmm. Look, this is a systole. This is systolic pattern. This is diastolic pattern. Correct? Uh, Dr. Sab, are you there or you have left already? Yeah. No, no, I'm here. Uh, you're talking for John, Dr. Janvi. No, not Jeremy, the other person who was asking. Who asked the question, yeah. yeah I'm still here. But still here, okay. Yeah. So, look, in beginning of this uh, QRS complex, this is systolic component, this is diastolic component. This is a respiratorogram. This is an expiratory phase, and this is an inspiratory phase. So, whatever the inspiratory and expiratory phase is, the blood will flow always from hepatic veins to Blood will always from hepatic veins to eyes. Yeah. Correct. Yes, sir. So what will happen in constrictive pericarditis as soon as the first beat of expiration happens? This is inspiration ends over here. Here's the expiration. The flow reversal happens in expiration. The blood from IV C2 gets to hepatic vein. Hmm. So we call this M shaped pattern where systolic reversal is seen with first beat of expiration in constrictive pericarditis. This is not seen in restrictive cardiomyopathies. And this is a very important sign for constrictive pericarditis when we talk of hepatic flow venous reversal with first beat of expiration. I hope I'm able to make it very clear what exactly you're looking for. Okay, sir. Do it tomorrow. Always you'll find whatever the ratio is. Other oh. thing where it will happen, it could happen tricuspid regurgitations. Severe TR, what will happen? You may find a flow reversal in early okay. system. Okay, sir. But that will not be dependent on respiration. In mm -hmm. any phase, it will be seen, whether inspiratory or expiratory. Is that clear? Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. So that basically, ha, reversals are saying that, you know, the flow is going back into the hepatic, hepatic veins. veins it's a very, okay. very, it's a, it's a very interesting phenomenon in pericarditis. Yeah. What exactly happens? Constrictive pericarditis is dependent on interventricular dependence. Hmm. So what this interventricular dependence is? As you inspire, RV will become bigger and LV will become smaller. Hmm. As you expire, the LV will become bigger and RV will become smaller. But where this blood will go? Because it's constricted hmm. in a shell of calcium. It cannot expand. Thoric. So the yeah. only place where it will go back is, it go back to the hepatic veins. That's how we explain this interventricular dependence leading to first beat of reversal in constrictive pericardial. Very well explained. Go ahead, next person, uh, Dr. Janvi, please go ahead. Namaste, sir. It was very nice uh, we are, uh, today. And I was just thinking, you, you have already not explained. not nice before? No, no, sir. You have already explained. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> no, no, it was always nice. <laughs> but you are always there with our uh, <laughs> guest. So that is it nice. It the best. Thing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Grateful. <laughs> 
some madam is teaching as good as you first teacher who is teaching as good as you so i oh start my god my madam you know <laughs> definitely <laughs> No, she is a passionate teacher and truly a passionate teacher. But I could see yes. today, that absolutely passionate, no doubt. Go ahead, go ahead with the questions. Jan, that, uh, question. Do, uh, sir, doming is uh, when the severity of MR then it is relevant na, to measure that doming uh, area. It's it's generally it's only done in cases where you find that the uh, cordy are teetering the mitral leaflets and you are finding a tenting. So you're finding a doming. You know, you will always rule out a valvular disease because in rheumatic valve also it will be doming. Yes. Okay. So when you know about the pathology, so that's why I said that if you understand the pathology, you will be able to evaluate accordingly. So, do we ever do a tenting in uh, calculation in the valvular uh, mitral stenosis? No. No. Right? Because we know what is the etiology. We know that there is a thickening here. The mitral leaflets are not thickened. They are just yes. not co-opting well. And they are uh, under tension due to a teethered cordy due to displaced papillary muscle. All right? Severity of size of the... That tenting is uh, telling you about the uh, there will be severe MR. Yeah, because correct. of this. Yeah, more is the tenting, more is the non cooptation, more is the uh, MR. MR. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Next, Baljit Sira. Dr. Baljit, go ahead. Uh, uh, good evening, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, I wanted to ask uh, uh, you said one of the predictors of poor outcome in HCM is mm. intraventricular dyssynchrony. How mm. to see that in ECO, ma'am? Can you please explain? Yeah, yeah so uh, that is also, I don't have a slide for that, uh, but you can also do this with the help of uh, an M mode across the LV, right? And in which we see that the contraction of the septum and uh, uh, the posterior wall is assessed and the other way is the speckle tracking of various segments. So are they all falling in the same time or they are not? Okay, so we generally assess the, the septum and the lateral walls, are they contracting simultaneously? And this is done to give them a benefit of CRT. Okay, okay so so uh, that is done in the, I don't have a slide here, Dr. Akesh, if, can do you have a slide or... So you would be showing this in some other uh, talk. Uh, we'll be talking about all this thing little above all the basic like. Yeah, uh, correct, correct, correct. For interventricular synchrony in the synchrony because this will come in the advanced course. Advanced, it's not, base, not basic. Yeah, this is not the basic. And we have to have a knowledge of uh, tissue doctor and stain data. Correct, data. correct, correct, correct. So we hold on this, but at your level, what uh, Dr. Hansa said categorically, look at this factor. Look at the septal wall thickness, dynamic LVOT gradient, mid systolic MR, and yeah. septal wall hypertrophy. And these are the. And of course, yeah, the history also, the history of unexplained syncope, the yeah. NSVT on the holters, and there is a family history of sudden unexpected uh, sudden cardiac death. So all these are the um, yes. um, uh, unfavorable predictors wherein one must think of uh, giving the patient an ICD. And four, okay, four, thank four you, factors thank like E to E prime ratio which should be high, LA volume should be high. Yeah. MRI and NT pro BNP levels in these people are pretty high. So yeah. a couple of these things are, and uh, like recently we discussed this topic and there's one drug which is going to be introduced in the Indian market is Mava Captain. So possibly okay. more role will come of detecting hypertrophic cardiopathy. The more important thing is you have to have think of a mark hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, whenever you look, asymmetrical septal lateral. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Naveen, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you for the class. Uh, does an layered, layered LV clot point to a specific uh, etiology or a diagnosis? Come back again. And does a layered LV clot point yeah. to a specific etiology or diagnosis? No, 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 no. So layered clot is not just 
uh, that does not mean a restrictive physiology as I was talking about the Loeffler's endocarditis with hyperisnophilia. So you must keep in mind, meaning if the if the apex is suppose apex or some segment, usually apical segments, if they are akinetic, even due to ischemic heart disease, you will start having clots there. The, the clots, they form, they, uh, they become organized and they become layered. Okay, so even there you can get layered clots. But when you see that the layered clots along with fibrosis, thickening, restrictive physiology, there is a, um, on the blood test, you're finding hyperisnophilia. Then you must think about, you know, a restrictive cardiomyopathy because of the Loeffler's uh, endocarditis. Okay, ma'am. Am I able to make you clear? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, because wherever clot usually forms on a segment which is dyskinetic. Okay? Either okay. dyskinetic or the endocardium is damaged. Anything okay. from akinetic to dyskinetic yes, for clot. But most important thing is when you differentiate between layer clot and uh, hyper... Uh, Restrictive cardiomyopathy, where apical obliteration is present because not because of a clot, it's yeah. because of a deposition over there. Yeah, so there will not be any hypokinesis or akinesis. It is normal kinetic, normal LV, normal RV, dilated LA, dilated RA. Patient presenting with restrictive filling pattern, and there's a complete a dissynchronization between atrioventricular contractions. Okay, sir. correct. Thank you, sir. So another question is, uh, some patient we put on RNA, uh, then the patient ejection fraction improves. So sometimes the peripartum cardiopathy improves spontaneously. So uh, does the response to RNA help us to uh, narrow down to a particular etiology? Man? No, no. RNA is basically to improve the heart failure symptoms. So that can be due to any etiology. Postpartum cardiomyopathy, of course, you know, the treatment pattern is same. You are identifying that the patient is um, having heart failure due to a cardiomyopathy, which is the result of postpartum insult, which is also nowadays considered to be genetic, right? So suppose the pa patient has delivered, you have found that the ejection fraction is less than 45%. She is having symptoms of dyspnea. So what will you do? You will give Arni. Similarly, a DCMP patient comes to you with heart failure symptoms. What will you do? You will start with ARNI to improve the um, uh, symptoms of failure. Yes, ma'am. Let's the response indicate to a particular, like if the patient is having an excellent response. To a, no, 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 no. So you should go back and uh, read about secubitril. Okay. Secubitril is a neprocillin uh, inhibitor. Neprolysin is... Uh, 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 kind of, you know, uh, chemical which is produced in the heart failure. All right. So yes, you just go back and study. You will find that, in fact, the pathology is the same, resulting due to various causes. And you are, you are hitting at the end result. But that will not help you to establish the um, uh, diagnosis. That, that is no way, like, you know, no way, I think I let Dr. Rakesh also answer this question, but I don't feel that uh, this in any way can, um, you know, lead to the uh, lead to the diagnosis. Okay, ma'am. Thanks. Yeah. Ma'am, do we have any, any recommendations for repeating an echo in follow-up of cardiomyopathy patients? Any particular time interval? Uh, time interval, I'm not aware, but of course, you know, at least six months. We generally give six months for RNA and all to uh, give the effect because first time diagnosed, you will first of all try to treat the heart failure symptoms and you would also want the um, ejection fraction to improve. So at least uh, six months uh, we give, three to six months before that even, uh, you know, in our country, we don't even give ICDs if the ejection fraction is less than 35% because we wait for the RNA to improve the ejection fraction and Take the patient out of that risk. Okay, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, Naveen is a very interesting phenomenon. I'm not really sure I have to look forward whether we can prescribe RNA in pregnancy, uh, postpartum cardiopathy or not. That's the first answer. Second important answer is many people they respond with the RNA. Many people do not. Have you ever thought of it? Why? 
the answer lies the people who have almost akinetic segments like ischemic cardiomyopathies. That ischemic cardiomyopathy, if it's akinetic dead segment, they never improve whatever you give. They lie down with 25-30% patient fraction. They do not improve at all. That's what my experience for a long time. People on army having 25% ejection fraction, six months down the line, still 25% ejection fractions. There has to be some reserve in the myocardium to army to improve that myocardial reserve. And what we do, at least I do in my practice is, I stop their army and switch them back to ARBs or AS inhibitors because that is much cheaper than army if they are not responding to them. But okay. once an army started and the response happened, you cannot stop army because we have seen reversal of a cardiopathy patient going back to previous ejection fraction with stoppage of this circuital versatile combination. And circuital versatile combination is a two drugs. ARBs, we have been using for a long time. Versatile was found to be very useful in number of trials for heart failure for reduced ejection fraction. Only this naprosine inhibitor, naprosaline inhibitor, was when it was added to ACE inhibitor, Valsartan, it was found to be more effective. As far as ACE inhibitor is concerned, Valsartan post delivery can be used. I'm not saying no. Pre delivery cannot. So we have to look for postpartum cardiomyopathy, whether they should use or not. I have to look and get back to you. But at the present moment, Certainly, this drug is very useful. Only those segments which recovers, a kinetic segment, I have not seen these people recovering in a kinetic segments. Okay. okay, so thanks a lot. Yeah. Any other questions before we say thank you to anybody else? And my humble request to all the delegates, please join earlier. You know, I've seen people joining at the last minute. Very unusual. I know attendance is important. I'm not denying anybody attendance. Eh? And this program is for your own benefit. It's not going to benefit Rakesh Gupta or Dr. Hansa Gupta in any form. If you learn, you'll become wiser and you'll do a good practice. And your good practice is not going to make any difference to our practice. So please join in time from next time onwards and uh, let me pay thanks on behalf of all of us from this group of 50, 49 comprehensive course on echocardiography plus the Jurop Institute of Echocardiography for an excellent deliberation. I really thank uh, Dr. Janvi Jaiwan uh, for saying excellent word for her. Look. That is what I was expecting. Like, and that's what she has proved to be today for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm happy that everyone has liked it. And um, I'm hopeful this will help you in the future to, you know, um, identify at least the cardiomyopathies. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. You also, in fact, you gave me this opportunity and trusted me that I'll be able to do justice. To these students i don't know how much i trust you but uh, believe my word i trust you much more than me that's mm. all i can say thank you so much so this dr anad deep wonder says amazing lecture thank you everybody stay safe see you next week and next week is going to be a little tough for all of you we'll have our first question answer session i'll show a demonstration answer your questions and then i'll take your exams on systolic function, diastolic function, and a cardiomyopathy. So get ready. Read something more to this week. Bye-bye. Take care. Stay safe. Shabba care. See you next week. Thank Good you. night. Thank you, everybody. Good night, sir. Good night, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Thank you. Good night, ma'am. Good night.